pilgrims for those history who likes history some real history come on history buffs like history i didn't like it when i was in school wish i did i you know you always start to like things when you get out of school <laughs> bad timing but uh kind of wish you said man i wish i had paid attention more i am history yeah you know that's the one thing that it's free though you say pay attention you have to pay it's free it's free it's kind of you know like one of those things you park the car in a driveway but you drive on a parkway it's like and you think the parkway would be where you park the car and the driveway would be the place where you drive the car <laughs> some of those things just stand up to me all right yeah i find humor in little things right miranda she loves my sense of humor she's the teacher in radiology school she'd be like tell us another one of your jokes we can't wait Let's see she's riveted every time okay let's go ahead and go to the lord in prayer heavenly father we pray to bless this time as we partake in thy word and we open it up we thank you for the history lord of this country we thank you for the history of the pilgrims for them coming over here and how your providence uh, the Lord was with them, that you just help them, Lord, to get settled in. And, and I pray that we get a blessing out of this message today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, something I don't generally do, and I hope that this message comes over well, but I tend to separate history and preaching. So if you notice in the, in the previous Thanksgiving messages, I'll give you a message and then I'll focus in on the events of Thanksgiving. But for some reason, I found such amazing providence by divine intervention in the history of the pilgrims and their Atlantic crossing that I was able to weave it into the scripture. Now, again, it's, it's something I've never done before, but I want to weave history into the Bible this morning. So with that, let's go ahead and turn over to Psalm. And I told you I took the Psalms 95 and then we're going to close with Psalm 100 when we get to the end of this. And I know it is the Sunday after Thanksgiving, but this is when we recognize Thanksgiving in the church. We come together. I like to make it like a four-day thing where we start on Wednesday, then we work all the way and kind of hit our apex there on Sunday. And we think about giving thanks all week. And I've been I've been pretty faithful to do that. Wednesday. I taught on, I preached on being thankful. We had Thanksgiving Thursday, and of course we Friday, Saturday. Now we're back again, and Sunday school was on thank, giving thanks. And this morning now will be on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. And what a Bible word it is. Psalm, Psalm 95 and verse 1. Psalm 95, and let's go to verse 1. It says... O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Now you're going to see some words here that pop out when you think of the pilgrims. Rock. The rock of our salvation. They named Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, based upon a rock that was there. Uh, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. They had the Thanksgiving feast and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea, and how important that was with the pilgrims. The sea is his. You know, when they first started out on their journey, they started out and it was a pleasant halfway across the Atlantic. For those that know history here and know their journey, they started out and that Mayflower sailed on pleasant seas until they got about right midway in the Atlantic. And then boy, did it turn. It turned seriously bad for them. And I'll talk more about their events. But the sea, the sea is his and he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker okay now as an introduction this is really interesting as i was reading the other day the pilgrims 
thought of themselves as God's chosen people. Not so much as the Jews, but as God's chosen people fleeing from the king of England, who they referred to as Pharaoh. They were under serious distress. They had a lot of persecution and religious intolerance. It was at a height in Europe where everything had to be done a certain way according to the Church of England. And if it wasn't done that way, they were persecuted. Sometimes worship was not allowed. They were not allowed to worship openly and freely. They weren't allowed to raise their kids in certain manners. Had to be by the government rules and the Church of England which really infuriated them because they wanted to have freedom to be able to raise their kids in a manner that they felt before God was to be done. So they referred to the king as Pharaoh. They were fleeing from religious intolerance and persecution. They referred to their voyage on the Mayflower as passing through the Red Sea. I never thought about this, but when you think about some of the events that occurred with them, it's a lot, and I'm not, I'm not one of these that believes America and England. I'm not a Brit British Israelite, if you know what they, they teach. They teach that Britain, uh, England, has all of the promises and blessings that were given to the tribe of Israel. Okay, I don't believe that. England is not the, tw the, 12, the 10 tribes of Israel, and America is not Judah, as they would teach. And America gets all the blessings that Judah got, and they take the place of the Jews, as God's chosen people. That's heresy. The Jews are the Jews. They have 12 tribes. They're Jews. They're Israelites. But could there be a similarity? And could the crossing of the pilgrims across the Atlantic be likened, and some of their struggles likened to that of Israel coming across the Red Sea? Now, they had already referred to the king of England as Pharaoh. Pharaoh. So to them, they were fleeing Egypt. And they were about to cross their Red Sea. And that sea would not be the Red Sea. That sea would be the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so uh, they refer to their voyage on the Mayflower as passing through the Red Sea into the wilderness. Okay, so you think about the Jews going through the Red Sea. Where did they wind up? In a wilderness. What was their promised land? God was going to get them to a certain place, but they had to go through the wilderness first. And when you think of when the pilgrims arrived here, what were they arriving to? They weren't arriving to what we have. They were arriving to a place that was a barren wilderness to them, a place that they did not know. Okay. When they arrived at their promised land, they offered thanksgiving prayers to God, just like the Israelites celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. No other group in history ever felt that they were reenacting the experience of the ancient Egyptians, as did America's first settlers. I didn't know if you knew that, but that's the way they felt in their mind when they came over. Now, the pilgrims set sail across the Atlantic Ocean for America on September 16, 1620, seeking a new life and religious freedom, just as Israel departed from Egypt and persecution to cross the Red Sea. They actually were headed, anybody know, for Virginia. We're actually headed for Virginia, but the Lord had other plans. Instead, midway through, and this is where he said, well, why did God give them, why didn't he just give them pleasant sailing all the way over? If he would have done that, they would have wound up with where the Virginia colony was. And if you know anything about the Virginia colony, it wasn't good. Nobody's ever found the Virginia colony, only remnants of it. They don't know what happened to those people, have no idea. But the Virginia colony didn't come over with the same idea. The Virginia colony came over seeking gold. They were seeking religious freedom. The Lord went and he blew into that water midway across and he sent some serious storms. And those storms blew them off course and caused them to go north, up this way, landing them where? At Cape Cod. At Cape Cod. Now they couldn't stay there at Cape Cod because winter was very severe and very rough. So they ended up over at Plymouth Rock, okay? They ended up there. So they encountered severe storms um, as they went across. Uh, they, they were actually headed for Virginia, but the Lord had other plans. Instead, he sent us severe storms during the latter end of their journey across the Atlantic that blew them off course north, north to Cape Cod. Now, I don't know if you know this, but 
Anybody know how many pilgrims made the initial journey? There were 102. Very good. We got a historian back there. 102 pilgrims made the journey. And by, by the time the first Thanksgiving, now they landed in 1620. The first Thanksgiving was in the fall of 1621. That's one year. By the time they had the first Thanksgiving, anybody know how many remained? The story? Close. 52. 52 remaining of the original. Okay. By the time of the first Thanksgiving, the fall of 1621, 52 of them, I'm sorry, 50, there were 50 that remained. 52 of them would be dead. 52 of them would be dead. So there were only 50 left. And in fact, Governor Bradford's wife was one of them that died. She was so distressed and in peril mentally that some believe she cat well, she did cast herself off the Mayflower into the cold waters and died by drowning. But some think she did it because she had a mental breakdown. This is how serious it was. Okay. Now, the pilgrims, some things that they were thankful for. Mid-Atlantic. I want you to consider this. When Israel fled through the Red Sea, in the midst of the sea, okay, and the pilgrims liken the journey here, so let's see if God likens anything. In the midst of a sea, God sends a whirlwind, right? A pillar of fire that was a corkscrew-type wind. And that went between, right in the midst of Israel, and Egypt, Pharaoh, and it divided those two groups right in the midst. Okay. So what happened to Mayflower midway through the Atlantic during one of the serious storms? Well, if you know history, the Mayflower had a main beam that came up this way, and this main beam began to bow and begin to move. And with the weight of the beam and the seriousness of the storm, it actually cracked. And they had really no way of repairing that. And they feared because they felt they had to return and go back to England. They weren't going to be able to make the trip. But the Lord intervened. There was a great iron screw. Just like that whirlwind. A great iron screw that they were able to, they got it off of a printing press, they were able to put through that main beam and hold it in place and secure that main beam with enough strength that it was able to finish the journey to get to the other side. Okay. The pilgrims were thankful for a great iron screw that they brought aboard the Mayflower. During the journey across the Atlantic, they encountered a severe storm. The storm cracked one of the massive wooden beams supporting the frame of the ship. Fortunately, the pass passengers had brought along a great iron screw, which helped raise the beam back into place so the ship could continue. Without this great iron screw, they could have never completed the journey. The iron screw was positioned right in the midst of the ship, just like a screw-type whirlwind was placed by God right in the midst of the Egyptians and the Israelites. Okay? Now, their first act upon reaching the New World was to draft and ratify the Mayfire Compact. This is before they ever got off the boat. At sunrise on November 11, 1620, 41 men signed the document that would set the course for democracy in America. One of the first acts of God for Israel after they crossed the Red Sea was to give them what? The law. Was to give them the law that would help them establish their nation. Israel, as soon as they crossed the Red Sea, one of the first acts of God was to give them the law, the Ten Commandments, and that law that Moses got from God, okay? The Mayflower Compact. You see how they were positioning themselves just like Israel and working this and saying, we need to have a government, we need to set up rules, we need to have a compact. Before they ever left that boat, they were preparing themselves for life on land. They signed the Mayflower Compact. A lot like the law that was given to Moses. Okay. Now, upon getting out of the boat, and before they ever really got to the shore, when they got in water that was just deep enough, before they entered that shore, 
they gave God praise and thanks. The first thing the pilgrims did upon arriving at the shore of the new world was to give God thanks. And we notice first thing Moses did when he gets across the Red Sea is he prays and exalts God. Let's turn there. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 1 and 2. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And when you look in chapter 14, it's all about Israel and Egypt going through the Red Sea. And then God miraculously turning the water over on the Egyptians. And it says in verse 30 of chapter 14. It's a look in verse 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and er, feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Now, you think about when they got to the shores of America, they were not thirsty for gold. They were thirsty to prepare a land for the word of God. And they prayed and they thanked God for getting them across there and exalted the God of heaven. And they were preparing a habitation for the word of God in a place where the word of God could be preached and believed and people could come to the knowledge of Christ. Their intention was not for gold. Their intention was to promote the word of God. <clears throat> and God blessed that. Now, what would it be without a great leader? Who sang this song? Moses. So you have to ask, who was their Moses? Who was their Moses? You know, we always say this. A church, a local assembly, often begins with one person. Great works often begin with one. Look at the Lutherans today. They're named Lutherans because of the great work of Martin Luther. Wesleyans, Methodists, are named that because of the great works of John Wesley. And we think about all the great people, the great men who have established great works. Salvation Army, established by one man. Road to Amaze Baptist Church. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God giving a commission to one person and saying, start a church. And here we are. Who was their Moses? Governor William Bradford. Governor William Bradford. The first thing, okay. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'll tell you this, you can't really have a work without a burden. And this is how God calls people. God puts a burden on your heart. So if you're going to do something great for God, God's going to burden you about something. God's going to put a burden there. And that burden is going to persist. You know, some people have said, how do I know if I'm called to preach? How do I know if I'm called to do something? Is the burden there? Is the burden there? God won't let you alone. Now, sometimes people can have that temporarily and that burden goes away. 
But if that burden persists, you're ignoring the call of God. If the burden is there. And the burden, I remember when my dad first started the church, the burden was there. It was there. And it, would not, it wouldn't go away. And when God called me to preach, the burden was there. It would not go away. I knew it in my heart one day it would happen. But the burden never came. And all of a sudden, when I hit 30, the burden hit. It was at that age, at 30. So for you men that are around the age of 30, maybe a little bit beyond 30, burdens. What's God burdening you with? If God's burdening with you with something, don't deny the call of God. Don't deny it. And this is why you come to church faithfully, because aren't you, aren't you searching out in your life what God would have for you? I mean, some of you young people in particular, don't you want to know what God has prepared for you? You get it by coming to church. That's where God initially puts the call. I'm not saying everybody who's here that's young is supposed to be a preacher. God can call you into secular life as well, can he? A lot of you get a burden for things and you say, man, I got that burden when I was in church. But God is calling you to do something. God is burdening your heart with something. Just like he did to Moses. He called Moses, Moses made a lot of excuses. Didn't want to go. Just think if he would have said eventually, no, I'm not doing this. We wouldn't have had the great story, would we have, of Israel crossing the Red Sea? You say, well, God could have done it with somebody different. He didn't want to. Why were you born? And what is your purpose? The pilgrims could have stayed over in England. They could have said, well, we'll just pray about it over here and work it out over here. They tried to go to Holland, didn't they? That didn't work out either. God didn't want them there. He wanted them somewhere else. They needed that leader. Just like Moses. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Verse 24, it says, by faith, Moses. Look in 23, by faith, Moses. 24, by faith, Moses. Then we come down here, 27, by faith, he, Moses, forsook Egypt. What did he do? He got out of there, didn't he? Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith. How's it going to be accomplished in your life? Things are going to be done by faith. We don't like that way, huh? Oftentimes we like, show me, Lord. Show me and I'll do it. No, the Lord says, faith. Oh, that's tough. Sometimes your faith is way up here, right? And you're riding high and you say, man, I'm riding high with God. There's nothing he can't do. Praise the Lord. I've watched him work in my life and your faith is at an all-time high. Then something happens and where's it go? Oh, and the bottom drops out. You know, oh, where is God? Oh, it's so tough. Oh, my faith. What happened to it? Doesn't it go up and doesn't it go down? Didn't they always say to Jesus, Lord, increase? Do you think midway across when the storms begin to hit, the main beam begin to crack? Let us return, right? Let us go back to England. But they needed someone to say no. The purpose is not to return. The purpose is to forge ahead. By faith. By faith. By faith they passed through the Red Sea. And you have to wonder. You have to wonder why they were on the ship. Did the government? You can't tell me they did that. They had Bibles. Did the governor read it? They had a preacher on board. Did the preacher read it? Hey, people, settle. Yeah, it's cracked. And yeah, it's pretty bad. But look, God gave us this great iron screw, and we fixed it. Would God have us go back? How many people on the Mayflower said, let us return, let us return. Just like the Jews said, let's go back to Egypt. Think maybe a mutiny? Hey, look, people were dying on the boat. We were running out of food. Doesn't it take a person to say, people, go home. 
you know, it's just bigger, bigger. But I am God. Weren't those verses available for them? Let us not be like Israel. Let us not return. By faith we can make it. And make it they did. The pilgrims were thankful for a great leader, Governor William Bradford. Listen to this. Through all the suffering that the pilgrims endured, he was the one that kept them together. In fact, never the Mayflower sailed back to England. Not one of the original colonists went back with it. Not one. Just as Israel had Moses, the pilgrims had Governor William Bradford. What was God done there? Now, here comes Joseph. Who is the Joseph? Think about the pilgrims. Who is the Joseph that you can say? He was not one of them. Joseph was sold into slavery. This man was also. Joseph gave them corn. This man taught them how to plant corn. Similarity. Oh, you got to be kidding me. In fact, Governor William Bradford told everybody, this is our Joseph. Who was it? His name was Wanto. But if it weren't for the other Indian, Squanto would have never appeared. Who was the other guy? You're right. Amen. Amen. Samba said, the pilgrims were thankful for Indian friends. Samba said, an Indian that appeared out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. And ironically spoke. Now just think about this. Say we're the pilgrims and we're on the land and here comes an Indian. You don't know whether to fire friend or foe, right? And the guy says, hello. Am I seeing a ghost? I'm Samoset. Say, well, he didn't speak. He was very broken. They say, where did he learn this? Well, you know how he learned it? Samoset. He was a fisherman. And he happened to fish alongside Englishmen in Maine. And his fishing caused him to learn English. And here he appears out of nowhere. I am Sam Sam. He goes back and he says, it's Quanto. He's fluent in English. Pilgrims were thankful for Indian friends. Do you think they got down on their knees and said, blessed be the God of heaven? An Indian that appeared out of nowhere and ironically spoke English which he had learned from English fishermen in Southeast Maine. Samoset then brought Squanto to them, who knew even better English. Squanto was instrumental in helping to create a peace treaty with who? He went back and he got chief. Chief Massasoit and the pilgrims. Now, God just had it that Chief Massasoit and his people were persecuted in their own land by Indian tribes around them. And they would have been decimated. They knew they needed help. And when they heard the English firing cannon and their muskets, they knew they had something that was intriguing as far as weapons. So they decided, Squanto went back to Massasoit, Massasoit, and he said, they've got weapons. He did kind of lie a little bit. He said that they had diseases in barrels. Anybody ever hear the story? They had diseases in barrels that they could unleash on the Indians at any time they wanted to. Yeah, germ warfare. And Massasoit was so taken by this that he said, we have to make peace with them. 
So they came in and they made peace. Joseph made peace between Pharaoh and Jacob's family. Okay, Joseph's family, Jacob, they went down to Egypt for corn. The similarities, kind of crazy. All right, here we go. Squanto is instrumental in helping to create a peace treaty with Chief Massasoit and the pilgrims. Chief Massasoit's people were being killed by enemy tribe, Indian tribe, all around them and needed an ally to help save them. They admired the weapons of the pilgrims and through this became allies with them. Governor William Bradford compared Squanto to Joseph. Both were sold into slavery. Squanto was sold into slavery to the English and wound up going all the way to England before returning to help save them. Governor William Bradford compared Squanto to Joseph again. It says, and were sent to save the people from, uh, from starvation. Joseph and Squanto helped save the people from starvation. Because if you understand this, the English had seeds they brought with them. But when they planted them in the American soil, the soil wasn't conducive to grow English seeds from Europe, and they didn't grow. But as God would have it, listen to this. I'm going to finish on Squanto, then I'm going to tell you. One of the greatest things, when you think about isn't it God that provides food for all men? And didn't we learn that on Wednesday? And when we pray, we ought to thank God for our food. They were going to starve. They had no way of planning for themselves. They had nothing that would grow there. So it just so happens. And I'll tell you the story. Is one, he was sent to help them plant corn. 1622, okay, as Squanto, they would have been there two years now, as Squanto lay mortally ill with a fever. I don't know if you know this. He asked Governor Bradford to pray for him that he might go to the English man's God in heaven. Squanto died in November of 1622, having bequeathed his possessions to the pilgrims as remembrance of his love. He gave everything he had to the pilgrims. And he asked Governor Bradford, can you show me how to go to the English man's heaven? I'm sure Governor Bradford walked him right through the plan of salvation. And when we get to heaven, we're going to see Squanto there. Amazing, isn't it? Isn't amazing? A man who was sold into slavery, gets released, learns English, doesn't understand maybe even what happened to him, comes back here with this language he's learned. Just as Joseph said at the end of his when when at the end of Genesis, you know why God did this? God sent me to preserve a posterity for you. And I would imagine that Squano said, I know why it happened. I was here to teach all of you and to speak to all of you. Good live. The pilgrims were thankful for the stores of corn. I don't know if you know this story. I didn't know it. But the Indians came into Cape Cod in the summer. And in the winter months, during the harvest, right in the fall, they would take all the corn that they grew there, the seeds, and they put them into barrels. And guess what they did with those barrels? They buried them. They buried them and they left. So there were no Indians there. In fact, the Indians that would have been there they called the Nasset Indians. They hated Englishmen, hated them, and would go out of their way to kill any Englishman. If they had been there when the pilgrims arrived, the pilgrims would have been killed. They weren't there. There was an abandoned village, and when the pilgrims came into the village, they noticed that there were lots of ground that were freshly turned over. And they dug up, and guess what they found? They found the stores of corn seed that was buried there, and they took that seed. It says the pilgrims were thankful for the stores of corn that they found buried in an abandoned Nasset Indian village. The Nasset Indians hated Englishmen and only moved out of the area for the winter months due to Cape Cod winters being so fierce. They were able to plant this corn in the spring of 1621, and without this store of corn, they would more than likely have died of starvation. They eventually made peace with the Nasset Indians and repaid them back for the corn that they took. 
It was Squanto that showed the pilgrims how to plant the corn, again, much like Joseph, opening the storehouses of corn for the people. The pilgrims were thankful and demonstrated their thankfulness at the first Thanksgiving in the fall of 1621. Ninety Wampanoag Indians and 50 English colonists gathered for a three-day harvest feast at Plymouth, Massachusetts. Food included lobsters. I asked Annette and Doug, I said, you have a good Thanksgiving? And they said, yeah, wonderful. And I said, did you eat some turkey? No, we don't really care for turkey too much. I said, what'd you eat? Lobster pot. Hmm. I, was like, I said, so did the pilgrims. Food included lobsters, venison, geese, duck, turkey, fish, and cornbread. Okay? So, how did our current Thanksgiving Day come to be? George Washington was the first president to declare Thanksgiving a holiday. Sarah Josepha Hale, you know her? She's the same one that wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. She lobbied throughout the course of her life to get Thanksgiving as a day of remembrance and thanksgiving to God. And she succeeded, but didn't find, died before she could actually see everything come to fruition. Uh, she persuaded Abraham Lincoln to declare Thanksgiving a national holiday. President Lincoln made it a national holiday in 1863. He declared it on the fall, uh, to, to, he declared it to fall on the fourth Thursday in November. Finally, Congress passed a law on December 26, 1941, ensuring that all Americans would celebrate a unified Thanksgiving every year on the fourth Thursday in November. Now let's turn to Psalm chapter 100. Psalm chapter 100. And you know that thanks, the word Thanksgiving has heavenly origins. In the book of Revelation, we find that the elders and the heavenly hosts and all that's up there, the angels, praise the Lord and offer to him, the Bible says, thanksgiving. It has heavenly origins. Okay, so Psalm 100 says this. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates. One day we're going to enter into heaven. We're going to enter into heaven with thanksgiving. But you have to think of the pilgrims. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now, through this message today, and through from Wednesday all the way till now, my goal is to create a thankful people. And I want you to go out of here today. I want you to be thankful. But also, before I close, I'd like to have a little fun. I'd love to do this with a little bit of Thanksgiving trivia and fun facts about Thanksgiving. So before we close that, uh, zoom and those on zoom don't leave i got some thanksgiving trivia so if you're on zoom and you know it shout it out put your hand up no, i can't see you all right so you get disadvantage the people here can answer these questions okay so my, my first question this is a good one here who was oceanus hopkins oceanus hopkins you say where'd you pull that name out of I saw a hand up. Who's got it? Who was Oceana Hopkins? Anyone? Any of you teachers? This is a good one. Take it, take it back to the kids when you teach. Oceana Hopkins. Anybody got a guess? The first baby born on the Mayflower during the Atlantic crossing. Oceana. That's why she was named Oceana. Anybody wonder what happened to her? I did, so I looked it up. <laughs> Unfortunately, she died at the age of two. Died at the age of two. The pilgrims initially left England with two ships. The Mayflower and the 
Put your hand up. Mayflower and uh, this one had a leak and turn around and go back and it was not fit for the sea to, for the crossing. So all of the pilgrims had to get onto the Mayflower instead of on two ships. They initially had two, the Mayflower and the Speedwell. Speedwell. Okay, so how many days did it take to make the journey across the Atlantic? This is ironic. I'll give you a clue. 66. 66. Crazy, huh? 66 days. Who was Peregrine White? Peregrine White. Named after a falcon. I think. Who was Peregrine White? She was the first child born in the Plymouth Colony. Okay, so one was born at sea, the other one born Plymouth Colony. What happened to her? I looked it up. Happy ending. She survived to adulthood. What state produces the most turkeys? That's it. That's it. It's Minnesota with 37 million turkeys. School's good for something, right? <laughs> This the finally <laughs> go back and thank your teacher. All right. The second state that produces the second rank state is North Carolina at second, 28 million turkeys. So Minnesota is first, North Carolina is second. What state produces the most pumpkin pies? And this one has Libby's, Libby's, Libby's on your label, label, label. You would like it, like it, like it on your table, table, table. <laughs> you younger generation of a pastor, you're nuts. Who knows the song? Hey, there's still someone here. Okay, Libby's. What state has Libby's? They produce almost 90% of the pumpkin pie filling. Okay, anybody? What state produces the most pumpkin pies? And it's a whopping 90% of all the processed pumpkins come from Illinois. Illinois. What state produces the most cranberries? I wouldn't have got this. I would have said somewhere on the East Coast, like Massachusetts or somewhere up there, Connecticut, because I think that's where Ocean Spray is up that way. But no, nope, it's Midwest, not Oklahoma. Most cranberries. Some of you have roots in this state. It's Wisconsin. Wisconsin. What state produces the most cranberries? Okay, now, Thanksgiving fun facts. I just got a couple of these and it will be dismissed. The average American eats 4,500 calories on Thanksgiving. Okay, so that's a lot of calories. Now, a lot of them think, man, that trip to fan and the turkey made me so tired. I couldn't get off the couch and I got couldn't do the dishes for my wife. Wanted to, but that trip to fan just knocked me out. Trip to fan, turkey has less trip to fan than chicken and other meats. Okay, so don't blame it on the tryptophan. But mentally, we say turkey. Afterwards, I got to fall asleep. 88% of Americans, with the exception of you two over there, 88% of Americans will eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Who had turkey? Or let's ask, who didn't have turkey? Okay, so that's roughly probably 88%. We got, yeah, didn't have turkey. All right. Americans consume 46 million turkeys on Thanksgiving. That's 535 million pounds of turkey. Black Friday is the busiest day of the year for plumbers. <laughs> While I was eating turkey at my in-laws, guess what happened? The sink backed up. My father-in-law was over there with a plunger. <laughs> and I thought to myself immediately, oh, how true it is. Black Friday is the busiest day for, for plumbers. Okay, now I don't think that's just because of the sink either. <laughs> All right, anybody, I'll throw this out as a trivia. How much white meat does the average turkey on Thanksgiving contain? Anybody take a stab? How much white meat? What percentage was? If you said 30%, you got the dark meat. 30% dark meat, it produces 70% white meat. Who likes white meat? We have any dark meat fans here? 
All right. Well, we're split a little bit. Okay. Uh, turkey has more protein for all of you weightlifters out there. Turkey has more protein than chicken or beef. So if some of your homes now start getting turkeys, now we understand. Got more protein. So if you're working out, turkey has more protein than chief, chicken or beef. The heaviest turkey ever recorded was named Tyson. And weighed, weighed a whopping 86 pounds. Uh, 86 pounds. All right. So Americans eat 50 million pumpkin pies on Thanksgiving. There are four towns in the U.S. named Turkey. One is in Arizona, another in Texas, Louisiana, and North Carolina. So if you're ever in those states and you're traveling through Turkey, you're in, still in, in the United States. The first football game on Thanksgiving in 1876 between two colleges, one being Yale and the other Princeton. I knew I'd get some Harvards there. And, of course, the NFL – Two teams always play on Thanksgiving, and they are Detroit and Dallas. Always play on Thanksgiving. All right, so that's my Thanksgiving fun facts, and I hope you learned a lot about Thanksgiving. With that, let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer and walk out of here thankful. Austin, go ahead and close this. Thank you.